Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wisconsin Water Week. I didn't actually know about this particular week until I found this conference and the convention in Stevens Point this year, and I just wanted to get involved. So today, what I will be doing is discussing a little bit about how we can wade in water education, a discussion on connecting students to waterways. Now, the Wisconsin Lakes and Rivers Partnership is looking primarily at the preservation and restoration of waterways because we are really trying to do our best to manage the local waterways we have because of water security and other things like that that are becoming more pressing issues as decades progress, right? So I'm Darian Becker. I am the environmental educator here at the Welty Environmental Center, and we are located in Southeast Wisconsin, where we are primarily working with pre-K through 12th grade and beyond, trying to get people outdoors and trying to engage people in nature education. Before we go any further though, I want to make sure that we acknowledge the lands on which we are standing and do a lot of our programming. So specifically in Southeast Wisconsin, a lot of the lands were originally managed and lived on by the Ho-Chunk Native Americans. Specifically, we were talking about the Zezé Te camp, which translated from the original Winnebago language was for Big Hill, which might allude to the idea of why we are called Big Hill Park. We are sitting right at the very top of a big hill and it's really cool being able to see the different elevation changes that happen in our park and looking at the flora and fauna taking advantage of that. We want to make sure that we are acknowledging those many generations of Ho-Chunk Native Americans and many others, right? We have a lot of different affiliations going on, a lot of really rich history here in the state of Wisconsin, and we want to make sure that we are acknowledging those Indigenous communities. A little bit about me. So I mentioned before that I am currently the environmental educator at Welty Environmental Center, but I would say that if I was to break down my upbringing, if you will, into three different parts, I would say that first and foremost, I am a lifelong learner. I have my bachelor's degree in environmental biology from Cornerstone University in Michigan, as well as my master's degree in wildlife and fisheries resources from West Virginia. So along those lines, once we collect all of that information, we have to do something with it, right? We can't just write books and have them sitting on shelves collecting dust. We have to make sure that we are asking more meaningful questions so we can fill in those knowledge gaps. And that's where the researching component comes into play. Before I got into graduate school, I took a little bit of time and went around the Midwest and did a lot of different really cool research projects with a lot of really cool collaborators, such as Emporia State University in Kansas and Oklahoma State University in Northeastern Oklahoma, doing a lot of different projects in the Flint Hills region there in the Midwest. Once we learn all of our information and we try to collect more information while asking those meaningful questions, trying to fill in those knowledge gaps. We have to be able to teach these things that we learn. So as I mentioned before, I'm working here at Welty, but before that I got a little bit of an interest in environmental education while I taught for a year in South Carolina. So I was able to teach in a lot of really rich habitats such as maritime forests and barrier islands, talking about barrier island formation and all of these estuary habitats and it was amazing. So I am back here in the Midwest in the Great Lakes states of Wisconsin, and I am very excited to chat about how Welty came into effect here. So Welty was formed in 1999, and like I mentioned before, we do a lot of programming with students and children of various ages, as well as adults and families and other groups. Primarily, we do a lot of our work through field trips, as well as summer and school year camps, public programming, and with different types of groups. And all of these programs that we do at Welty are trying to shape our general mission, which is through providing leadership in environmental education by equitably engaging the diverse residents of the state line region. So we're not only serving Southeast Wisconsin, we're also serving some of North Central Illinois as well. But we are fostering that appreciation for nature and providing that 
that outlet for learning about how to be stewards of the environment in which we live and maybe sometimes recreation is involved there as well. All right, so our first step of learning how to wade in environmental education is we need to connect our students to their waterways, right? And our first question is, what are our waterways that we can connect our students to? And I really love one of my teachers who I learned from in the northern part of the lower peninsula of Michigan in the Kalkaska County sort of area is loving thy downstream neighbor. And that idea is really interesting to me because we are able to expand our horizons a little bit, looking more large scale at not just ourselves and what the impacts that we make affect ourselves. We're not only looking at ourselves, but also to others. So who is our downstream neighbor? Talking about the Ho-Chunk Native Americans who were once here, we have the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, Sauk, and Meshwaki who were originally here, who would be the downstream neighbors of the Ho-Chunk Native Americans who were once here at that big hill, as I mentioned previously. And the idea of a watershed is really interesting because when you're talking about a body of water or a stream, where it comes from, right, you typically talk about a stream coming from the headwaters where the water originally comes out from the ground, typically from an aquifer of some kind, but those are the headwaters, right? And anything below that, you can reach the mouth of the stream. Typically, for instance, the Mississippi River makes it down all the way to Louisiana Delta. That is the mouth of the Mississippi River, but the headwaters have to start somewhere and thinking of it like a body. For instance, if your head is infected, your the entire rest of your body will follow suit after a while. Thinking about these streams as veins in an organ or in a body being our watershed, we're looking at these different stream bodies that are all connected, such as the Rock River, we also have Turtle Creek here in Southeast Wisconsin and Beloit specifically where we are located. And we also have some tributaries, right? We have our main stream, we have our tributaries that are feeding into the larger stream itself. Some of them don't even have names because they're so small. For instance, our Goose Creek here at Big Hill Park isn't technically called Goose Creek, but it's just named that by the locals because they know it to be called Goose Creek. So once we have that establishment of what our water bodies are that we are potentially impacting, we have to figure out those groups of people who will also be impacted by the choices that we make within our watershed, right? So we think of our space, now we're thinking of our people. Here in Beloit, we are specifically working with some groups such as the School District of Beloit. We do a lot of programming with them as well as the State Line Boys and Girls Club located here in Beloit. We do some summer programming with them. We do after school programs with them sometimes. And we also have Hendricks Career Tech located here in the State Line region. That reaches, like I mentioned, that extent of Southeast Wisconsin, upwards as far north as Madison to as far south as to Rockford, Illinois and beyond. Now, the question is that we need to ask when we are putting together these programs and we're trying to engage these students and these peoples is what is our nearest water body? So sometimes it might be a little more challenging, especially in areas that don't have as many waterways as we do in, for instance, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, these Great Lakes states that have obviously large lakes that are here, <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't be called the Great Lakes states, right? So our nearest water body, we have to think about, and sometimes it could be something as simple as a sediment pond that's created for the collection of stream overflow or something along those lines. We have an impact on these water bodies, whether they're man-made or they are naturally made. So once we identify those water bodies, we need to figure out how we're connecting these people. We know who they are. We know the water bodies that they're engaging with or that they're secondhand influencing. 
but we need to identify these different programs that are available for our students to engage with their water bodies. And there are so many. This is just the short list of the ones that I'm familiar with. So definitely at start adding to the list, right? We're continually learning. But one of the big ones that we work with here at Welty is Project Learning Tree. And what's really interesting about them is they just recently came out with a new edition of their kindergarten through eighth grade curriculum guide, which is absolutely amazing. Highly recommend both of them, actually, because, you know, some of them are improved, some of them are brand new, but some of them are, you know, coming from the original edition. So highly recommend both of those. We also have in the state of Wisconsin, we are so incredibly blessed with the University of Wisconsin and Stevens Point because they do so much work for environmental education across the entire state. One of which is their urban forest lesson guide, which you might think urban forest, aren't we talking about wetlands? But hold on, hold on, we'll get there. And we also have some programs such as Project Wet. We have Hook, Line, and Thinker from Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. So thinking a little more state government, maybe it's not necessarily something you would think of when you hear curriculum development, but they definitely have materials available for you to engage with your students. And I was really interested in this one. So this top left one or top right one, Respect Our Mother Earth, is from the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, which is incredibly amazing, especially when you want to engage your students in not only the ecology, but also the traditional ecological knowledge of the area that you're studying. And I'll give an example of one of those in a little bit. So which have you used before and which are your favorites? So depending on your program and where you're located and what your students are and so on and so forth, you might be kind of dependent on one over the other, depending on your organization, you might be set to one of those curricula. For instance, obviously, if you're a Department of Natural Resources environmental educator, you might be working more specifically with the state guidelines. A lot of times we have the next generation science standards that we work with for developing these curriculum plans, and a lot of these coincide with those standards. And you know, every state has its own standards and other things like that to consider. So these next few slides are going to be highlighting some really cool applications and examples of activities that you could do from each of these curriculum guides that I mentioned previously. The first one, we're going to look at the Glyphwick, so the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. And one of these is a game. It's a board game. So it's similar to Candyland you could describe to your students. And each of the squares has a different activity or action that your fish is doing. More specifically, we're looking at walleye and how they are going from egg to fry to adult and incorporating a lot of that scientific literacy in this board game, essentially. And you're just rolling dice to see how far you go. And the first one to the finish ends up winning. It's a very, it's a very coherent and cohesive game that students might be able to get engaged with. One of the things that I've run into, however, when incorporating this game in my curriculum is sometimes the words are really small and the students don't really wanna take the time to read them, right? So there are many different ways in which we can modify these curricula. We don't have to take them as they are at face value. We can know our students and maybe know their limitations, know the different things that we can try to apply. For instance, we at Welty love to have kids run around. We love the activity component, the exercise component. We love to have kids run around and engage with these different activities because they're having a lot more fun and they're just running around and having the time of their lives, but they're also getting that exposure to those different words that they wouldn't originally hear or they would skim over in a textbook, right? But moving forward with that, it's, it's a pretty fun game and I highly recommend it. It is in the guide that I mentioned before. It's in it's over the span of two pages, so use that as you will. But I think this is a really great foundation for making games to the point that they are still educational. They're bringing that information in there. They're 
you know, getting to a point where a lot of different management practices of our water bodies are influencing a lot of the animals living in there, including walleye. A lot of these programs are going to be place-based. However, we are not sometimes able to go to those places. Ideally, for instance, with hook, line, and thinker, you're reading the water in the context of being a fisher person, right? You want to find a good spot where all of those fish are located, but there are some certain characteristics of their habitat that you'll want to identify. So you can then try to focus on those areas when you're fishing. But unfortunately, sometimes due to funding, we don't have the possibility or the ability to go to these locations to look at them firsthand. So we need to find ways in order to bring the wetland to our classrooms. And there are definitely a lot of ways in which you can do that. You could try to simulate a wetland. And maybe if your classroom is able to have a fish tank, you can incorporate those things like what are the requirements for our fish to survive happily in its tank? You can get sterilite tubs and get some mud and water and see if there are any insects living there. Well, what are the insects providing for fish? They're providing food, so they might be hanging around there. Other ways in which we can incorporate this place-based environment is not entirely limited to going to the outdoors. There are a lot of different ways in which you can bring that sort of method to the classroom. And here we are with urban forests again, right? So incorporating different sort of topics, not necessarily related to water, can be related if you're looking in a larger scale, right? So kind of talking about that watershed theme again. When you're talking about a water system, a lot of different components are being added to that system and creating long-term drastic impacts, right? So the presence or absence of trees in an urban system can do a lot of different things, positive, right, or possibly negative to a water system. And you can talk about that in the context of water. What are trees providing for waterways? They're allowing for the ability to filter out a lot of those nasty runoff pollutants that could potentially harm our plants and animals. And there are other ways in which we can relate topics to water such as geography, we can talk about math, as well as world history, engineering, art, physics, chemistry, the list goes on, really. You can talk about geography in the scheme of how is the water, the system itself, having its own geography, because there are different depths, it allows for different niches for different animals and plants, and they have all of the resources they need in those different parts of the pond. Some animals might not use other parts of the pond because, for instance, if you're a small fish, you don't want to go in the deep end, it's too cold, or something along those lines. Math is always something that can be involved with science because they coincide so incredibly well. And specifically with art, Art is everywhere, right? And art is in nature, and we're trying to incorporate that art in STEM to make STEAM. And physics and chemistry can definitely be involved in that water science that you try to incorporate in your classrooms as well. And like I said, this is not an extensive list. There are so many other resources available for teachers and STEM professionals and anybody, even parents who are interested in engaging their children or students with different scientific applications. For instance, the Cary Institute has an all-inclusive curriculum guide and protocols for the classroom before the field trip and after the field trip. That is a really great resource to have for looking at leaf pack in particular, how macroinvertebrates are engaging with some of those abiotic factors, those non-living things in our water systems, right? Thinking about dissolved oxygen and nutrients and how the leaf fall that we see every fall in the year is affecting our water systems and the plants and animals that are living there. Don't Let It Loose has some classroom programs talking about, well, I have my goldfish in the fish tank for the school year, talking about those different requirements for our fish to be happy in its habitat, but I don't really know what to do with that fish at the end of the year. Definitely do not let it go in the wild. Goldfish are uh, notoriously known for being invasive species and they can get very carried away after a while being in a native system. And there are so many other things. 
the Cary Institute is associated with the Leaf Pack Network, and the Leaf Pack Network has its own website with all of these different resources available. And there are so many more finding ways to engage your students. It's pretty phenomenal. And the question remains, will there be funding? I know funding is very challenging. However, there are resources available for teachers and STEM professionals and parents who are interested in getting their students engaged, particularly for STEM professionals, STEM instructional coaches and teachers, not so much for parents. But the Go Outside Fund through the Natural Resource Foundation of Wisconsin has some funding available with different types of accreditation that needs to be required and things like that. These links are available to view as well. And the other that is relatively local to the state of Wisconsin in particular is the Wheels to Woods program through the Society of American Foresters and the Wisconsin Society of Science Teachers. That was a mouthful. And again, Society of American Foresters, what does forestry have to do with anything? We learned about that before. Trees need water to survive, so it's all related, right? That's what's the beauty of ecology for sure. Now that we're connecting our students to their waterways, we have the opportunity of connecting our students to the people who are doing the studying of our waterways, which is amazing. Let's get going. So the breakdown that I have for this section is there are two main ways in which you can engage your students with these professionals. The first one is passive engagement. And I define passive engagement as you only really get out of it as much as you put into it. So one of my favorite ways in which I engage with students as a wetland professional myself is Skype a scientist. And Skype a scientist is free for anybody to be involved, adult groups, you know, church groups, school groups, any group, any group, any age, any anything that's that's available for them. And their mission is connecting scientists with people in as many ways as we possibly can. Even though it's called Skype a scientist, you can meet through Google Meet, you can meet through Zoom, kind of like what we're doing now. And the demographic, like I said, is anybody. Absolutely anybody can be engaged with Skype a scientist. And it's amazing. You can choose from a list of topics that you want to cover, the availability that you have with your group, times of day, days of the week, and other things. And Skype a, Skype a scientist does the pairing for you. So like I said, it's relatively passive. You fill out a Google form in five minutes and you will be paired with a scientist throughout the school year, which is awesome. And these are examples of titles of presentations that I have given to school groups over the last couple of years. Some as far as Seattle, Washington, to as far east as the Bronx in New York, and it is a, an absolutely wonderful program. I will scream from the rooftops how amazing Skype a Scientist is. And on the flip side, we have active engagement. So passive engagement was only taking out as much as you put in. Active engagement has a lot more structure to it. So for instance, Environmenters program is pretty not stringent per se. However, it is only targeted toward high school students simply because their mission is to mentor and motivate students. They're acquiring different skills for getting them ready for college and they're becoming more active stewards in their communities. And more specifically compared to Skype scientists, you're not only connecting to professionals, you're connecting to college students, professors and possible mentors. And the steps to be involved are a little tricky because you need to have a parent organization that is able to host your region chapter, essentially. And if your region doesn't have a chapter, you need to establish one with a university. Kind of on the other side of things, GLOBE, which is Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment, we'll talk a lot more about GLOBE in a few minutes, has a little bit less structured, less stringent, less scary, I guess. I don't know. But they are primarily increasing awareness of individuals throughout the world about the global environment. They're increasing scientific understanding for students. They're allowing these first hands, hands on applications of science in a lot of these very 
captivating ways, which is a lot of fun. And it supports the improved student achievement of science and mathematics. Like I said, that science and math definitely goes hand in hand. And this is only catered toward K through 12, but ideally it's intermediate to high school, but you can apply it in any which way you can. It can be, you know, complicated or it can be simplified. There's a lot of leniency there, which is really neat. And the people you're connected with are other GLOBE schools, which is incredibly cool. You can collaborate with schools from different states or even different countries around the world. And you get to help NASA scientists with collecting data for their satellites, which is so incredibly cool. And the steps to get involved are a tiny bit tricky, but first of all, you need to create an account with GLOBE, which is pretty straightforward. And you need to complete in-person trainings or complete a protocol e-training Welty Environmental Center, for instance, we hosted over the last two years, we hosted some trainings for our intermediate and high school teachers so they can incorporate these different GLOBE protocols in their classrooms with their students and have it coincide with the material that they already plan on covering. Kind of leaning into that, right? We're going to talk a little bit about the water education that we specifically have at the Welty Environmental Center. And when talking about water education, for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to think of it like a triangle. And each side has a different part of a program that we need to somehow incorporate in order to make a successful program, right? First one is education, next is investigation, and the other is recreation. Well, what we learn from geometry is triangles can come in all shapes and sizes, right? Depending on the angles of the corners and other things like that. And that's not necessarily bad, right? Different organizations and even classrooms have different missions, different values. They have different structural inferences. They have different targets that they need to meet, which is absolutely fine. Sometimes you lean more toward investigation and other times you just need to get kids outside in the water playing. And that's, that's, neither of those are bad. And my question is for you. So this is just an idea for the sake of the structure of this presentation. And this is a really good way of thinking about how we structure our programs and what sorts of boxes we need to check, if you will. But there could be other words that we could add to that shape, right? Maybe our triangle needs to be a rhombus or something along those lines. So maybe other words such as creativity or innovation need to be in this sort of shape, these facets of implementing our water science programs. And we need to think about those different facets for our case, right? So maybe some places have a triangle and some other places have a kite-shaped rhombus, who knows? But it's really good to collaborate with each other and try to compare our programs and how they're structured and what boxes we usually check and what works and what doesn't. Here at the Welty Environmental Center regarding education, we do a lot of field trips like I mentioned before. And one of them is our fifth grade field trips that are actually starting up here in May, which is super exciting. We, in 2022, we had 454 students who were engaged, and that included our fifth grade students who came for their field trip, and as well as our high school volunteers who came out to help our students be engaged, and they directed the activities and worked a lot with the fifth grade students, and that was a lot of fun for them. What was especially unique for this high school fifth grade sort of collaboration was the high school students were able to get some coursework credit for their either general environmental science or advanced placement environmental science courses. So they had a little bit of skin in the game, which is a lot of fun. Some of the topics that we cover in this field trip include the difference between biotic and abiotic factors. We're looking at what things are living and non-living in our environments and how they're working together, that ecology aspect of it. We're also looking a lot at macro invertebrate identification. So getting a little understanding of how those abiotic factors are influencing our biotic factors and how maybe they coincide with one another and tell the same story when we're talking about water quality. And when talking about water quality, we're mostly looking at Lamotte test kits, which is incredibly user-friendly. You use test tabs, 
put them in a vial with some water, you shake them up until they're dissolved and you see if there's a color change. And because of the time restriction that we have with this field trip, it works out really well because I think the longest test out of all five that we look at is about five or so minutes, which isn't entirely bad at all. And with that, we're able to look at dissolved oxygen, nitrates, phosphates, turbidity, and pH, which is really cool that we're able to get a really good snapshot of how our water quality is looking at Goose Creek at that point in time throughout the semester. Switching a little bit into investigation, talking about GLOBE again, so that global learning and observations to benefit the environment. We have the great opportunity to work with the UW-Madison, so University of Wisconsin in Madison, the Center for Climatic Research. We are co-authors on a National Science Foundation Geopaths grant. So we're working specifically with UW-Madison and Beloit School District and a few other organizations to incorporate educational leadership for community outreach and mentoring for the environment, or otherwise we call welcome, how welcoming. And what's really unique about this opportunity is we have the flexibility to work with our high school interns to get them interested in a topic and allow them to build their own research projects. For instance, last year, our intern Raven Reginald looked at macroinvertebrate communities and how nitrate concentrations are affecting them throughout the Rock River watershed. Again, talking watershed scale, right? Talking about the entire system within Beloit and elsewhere and seeing how those macroinvertebrates are being affected. And what's incredibly cool is we have so many deliverables from this grant, one of which is the research poster that Raven put together last year, in addition to our other two interns who did some soil work for us and looked at different components of soil structure and temperature and things like that. But these, these posters are incredible. And you're able to break down the entire project and working with these students, they're able to concisely discuss their work with you. They're able to discuss how their results are even related to the grand scheme of things. Why should we care that nitrates are affecting macroinvertebrates? What do macroinvertebrates have to do for us, right? But we are able to help these students look a little more broadly and say, okay, even though I don't say hello to, for instance, a dragonfly nymph every day, we have a relationship there where my behaviors affect the livelihood of these macroinvertebrates, which is a really cool thing to see. And the students definitely change over the course of the semester with their understanding of the things that they're studying and their confidence in communicating science, which is incredible. And Another thing which is really cool is one project can potentially lead to another. So with Raven's project, she discussed that the results found can vary by other factors such as dissolved oxygen and tree cover. And this year I am working with Oliver Devlin and he is studying how dissolved oxygen and nitrates are affected by deciduous trees, which allude to the idea of how much leaf fall is falling into the streams and causing a lot of that nutrient mixing and other things like that. And along those same lines, GLOBE has the partnership in the in entire Midwest and the entire nation. They have student research symposia for each region, Midwest, Northeast, Northwest, and so on. And these students are able to not only communicate their research to us, you know, who we've worked with for months and months, but also professionals from University of Wisconsin at Madison and other students from around the Midwest. This weekend, we will be attending in Madison and there will be 47 students there from Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin, which is an incredible opportunity to work with students and collaborate with them, maybe thinking of projects that they could pursue when they go off to college. Switching gears over to recreation. A lot of what we do, like I mentioned before, is summer camps. Specifically, we have our traditional Big Hill Adventure Camp, which we have from Monday to Friday, eight to five. And with a little bit of change of structure, so this year we're only going to have about six weeks of camp, and I'll tell you why in a second. 
And previous years, we've had 10 and a half to 11 and a half weeks. And that half a week is because the school district has to start their school year and we can't have camp during school. That makes sense. And in previous years, we've had about 65 unique campers per summer. So sometimes our campers come for the entire summer, which is absolutely great. Others come and go with alternate weeks, depending on their availability during the summer. Regarding employment, though, we have four to five camp educators. Usually we have two in the morning, two in the afternoon, so it is a part-time position. But these people are high school and college students, which is really cool being able to have that opportunity to learn as well as work and have a lot of fun doing it too. And I really love that this position allows for these students to learn a lot more about science education and just ecology in general. And these students are either coming from or going to Beloit College, UW-Stevens Point, Platteville, and Blackhawk Technical College. So a lot of these students are coming in from different places, but they're going off with a lot of really cool work experience while being here. And one of the ways in which we engage students in these water-based, place-based education programs is we have entire weeks dedicated to water. In 2021, we had Wet and Wild Week, which was looking a lot about the wetland component as well as how animals are engaging with water and wetlands and other things like that. And last summer, we had Wetlands of Wisconsin, where we were where we were able to go to different wetlands and do a lot of water quality assessments and do all of these different science-y based things, right? And having these kids be able to see a lot of really unique areas. For instance, Nigrin Wetlands is an absolutely stunning system in Northern Illinois, which I highly recommend anybody to attend. We also visited Sweet Island Park in Wisconsin here in Beloit, as well as Leeson Park, which is local in Beloit. So with the Rock River being so close to us, we have a lot of different opportunities to see either the confluence of the Rock River at nature at the confluence in Illinois, or seeing all of these different riverside areas and how maybe the water quality is being affected by the area surrounding it. So this summer, because we have our six weeks of camp, we have a little bit of flexibility and we are serving additional camps this summer, which we're really excited for. Our first one is our citizen science camp. So we'll be incorporating a lot of those globe protocols. We'll not only be looking at hydrology, but we'll also be looking at air with the atmosphere. We'll be looking at soil in the pedosphere. We'll be looking at the earth as a system, which is incredibly cool. And we also have the biosphere, which are our living things and how they all interact with ecology, which is incredibly cool. And Muddy Water Steminist Camp is a collaboration with Hendrix Career Tech, which I mentioned previously. And we will be serving young women who are in either intermediate or high school from 12 to 17. And we'll be bringing in a lot of guest speakers and talking about careers in STEM and how we can be engaged in aquatic sciences and how we can take what we learn and teach other people because that's how change happens. That's how the snowball effect happens or the butterfly effect, depending on which way you want to think about it. And we'll be thinking about specific careers. We'll be talking about different management goals of wetland managers and different professionals. Because when I was in school, the only thing that I was ever told that I could do, and everybody has their own story, but it was either the Department of Natural Resources or the Park Service, and you had to be a park ranger or a warden or something. But there are so many different avenues that you can take in water science, and we know that. Maybe we know that, but the students don't know that unless we tell them and show them, which is so incredibly cool that there are so many women in STEM doing a lot of really cool things, empowering them to get engaged with their waterways and find ways to volunteer and do all of these other things. So I am just one of many, 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 many people who are working together to engage students in their local waterways. 
And I have to thank the National Science Foundation for funding. The Muddy Water Steminist Camp is a supplement to our Geopaths grant, which is our welcome grant that I mentioned before. Michael Nataro is the director of the Center for Climatic Research at the Nelson Institute in UW-Madison. And we have the school district of Beloit administrators and teachers and students. We have career tech, Derek Carter and Susan Day, who are amazing and working together to get muddy waters off the ground, as well as my colleagues here at Welty Environmental Center, Brenda Plackins and Aaron Wilson, as well as our welcome interns and summer camp educators. So with that, I will gladly take any questions. Feel free to contact me. You can contact Welty Environmental Center. You can contact me. You can contact Erin. You can contact Brenda. Let's get connected, right? So this is how we can help our students connect to their watershed by connecting many different resources together to create that watershed of knowledge, right? And with that, I hope you have a great rest of your day and enjoy Wisconsin Water Week. <laughs>